Good morning and welcome. It is good to be with you this morning. It's good to be back. We were away last week and enjoyed a bit of time uh, resting and doing nothing. I can do nothing pretty well. And it was good to rest, but it is good to be back in God's house. And if you've taken a look through your bulletin, I think you'll notice there's a focus on peace this morning. And we start out with our first hymn, 590, Sweet Peace, The Gift of God's Love. Hymn 590, Let's Sing Together. church family, words cannot express my gratefulness for your cards, phone calls, especially your prayers during my recuperation from surgery. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Mary Ellen Treese, and she notes in Lamentations 3, 22, and 23, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Continue to pray for Mary Ellen as she is still recovering. Recuperation from knee surgery doesn't happen in a week. And uh, others, certainly Burdett, as he has a long road to recovery ahead, and others that are dealing with various things. So keep one another in prayer. Our call to worship we find in the first five verses of chapter five of the book of Romans. And we read there, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh, worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. There is a lot in these five verses that we could get into and look at, 
But I just want to kind of take an overview as we think of this in terms of a call to worship. Why are we here today to worship God? We, we look at this and say, I don't see anything about worship specifically in these words, but there's much about the God that we are here to worship this morning. Of course, the first clue there says, therefore, and when you look at a therefore, you see what the, there, what the therefore is there for. And immediately in the previous chapter, thank you, John, you set up well in Sunday school this morning. Chapter four is talking about Abraham. And we have there, therefore being justified by faith, the picture of Abraham's faith given to us and recorded in God's word. So we're coming off of that in chapter four. And Paul writes, therefore being justified by faith. And then we see again in verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we stand. It is by faith. We are justified not by religion and good works. Faith can't be earned. Faith cannot be purchased. We can never accrue and amass enough wealth to purchase faith. We don't get faith by status. I can't be important enough to get faith. Faith can only be received. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have our faith increased by time spent in God's word. And certainly it is God's word, the gospel, that gives us that initial faith to put our trust where we get peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith or by faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not because of us. Not of, uh, grace are ye saved by faith, that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Why? Because we would boast. We would take glory and look what I've done to receive faith. And then it goes on to say in verse 10, because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Why? Because all the glory goes back to God. Mm -hmm. So the faith we receive because of our trust in the good news, the gospel message. Then we read, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. And it says, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope. Standing and rejoicing indicates, obviously, joy in that last piece, but the standing talks about something that we've got confidence. We've got a foundation. And I think that is delivered then to us in the next three verses, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. That we don't like to focus on. Nobody likes tribulations. Nobody likes testings and the afflictions of life. But we see here... I think what is laid out is the Christian experience, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Tribulation or affliction brings about patience. Patience that is spoken of here is talking about a steadfastness or constancy. How do you know that you're steadfast? How do you know that you're constant in your Christian life apart from tribulation? How do you know the thing that you've created is going to stand up to the storms of life until it gets tested. You get a new car, you jump in, put the key in the ignition, and some of them still, or push the button, mm -hmm. and you don't know that it's going to hold up to the Pennsylvania roads until you start driving around. You're hoping that wheel doesn't go rolling off and into the ditch. You don't know that the home that's built is going to hold up until that first storm shakes it. And it's like, okay, it didn't leak and it didn't blow away. Much the same in our Christian life, God's testing us for our own good to determine our constancy and steadfastness in him, but also so that the world can see this is real. Amen. This is not some fad or influence that, oh, it's religion. No, this is something that we stand in. And it brings about patience. And patience brings about experience. That's, as it were, the approval. You've gotten to the end of the test to say, yes, you passed. Okay, Christian, there's another test coming, though. 
And so life is a series of tribulations and trials. They don't end. Why? Because we're continually being further grounded, further rooted into our found foundation, Jesus Christ. Patience works experience and experience hope. Hope is assurance or confidence. And it blends into that and hope maketh not ashamed. That's that assurance that leads to that confidence that gives us not ashamedness, if I can say that. Mm -hmm. We have nothing with which we need to look back and say, I'm ashamed of that, if we allow God's work to continue through us. And it brings us all back to, we stand and rejoice in hope, and the end of that Christian experience is hope, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We see so much in here. We see the Trinity. We see Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in this experience. They're inseparable, and they're all part of that. We've got all three living in us through the person of the Holy Ghost so that we can go through the trials and tribulations of life. We can go through that experience. We can receive the approval, and we can stand and rejoice, not because of ourselves, but because of him. And so it is more than fitting that this is a call to worship this morning because what it does is point everything away from us, nothing of ourselves, all of him. Mm -hmm. And it is here that we stand this morning to rejoice and to praise God our Father and his goodness to us. Thank you, Philip. With that introduction, we could easily say amen have a word of prayer and go home. You've been well fed already by the word of God and instructed in it and we're grateful for that and are here to worship the Lord. So we're gonna stick around and spend some time together further in the word of God. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Proverbs chapter one. Proverbs chapter one. We'll be reading verses 1 through 9 this morning. Proverbs chapter 1, 1 through 9, and when you found it, would you please stand with me in reverence to God's word. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark saying, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Would you join with me in prayer before the Lord? Father, it is a privilege to be in your presence. And we are so grateful to know that as we meet together in a corporate fashion as a body of believers, that you are here in the midst, as is our Savior, for he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Father, we have come to worship you. Calm our hearts. Turn us away from the thoughts that would occupy us from the week past or the week to come. Turn our attention to your word, the word of God. May it have its effective ministry in our lives. Father, thank you for each one who has come. And I pray, whether here individually or as family units, that you might work in these lives for your glory so that your name be praised and Jesus Christ be honored and glorified. Father, thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit within, so that he takes the word, and he brings the application to our lives, and he 
brings conviction to know, to understand what God has said, and then, dear Father, to be in perfect obedience to your word and thus to you. Lord, we pray for those who could not be with us, thinking of those who are facing the physical difficulties of life, some perhaps who are passing through emotional upheaval at the present time. And Father, for those who are struggling spiritually, whatever that need may be, whether for salvation or whether for a confidence to walk with the Lord our God, I pray that you would direct our hearts to be obedient and to be joyful as we move through the day today and the week that is before us. Thank you, Father, for being here with us through your Spirit, by your Son, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Thank you so very much. In our precious Savior's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let me share with you quickly a couple of announcements. This comes from Burdette's wife, Cindy. Good news. Burdette no longer has a feeding tube. He has been eating soft foods and drinking liquids. His case manager says that he is doing remarkably well with everything. And then this brief update that came afterward, Burdette is now at Lancaster Rehab on Good Drive. He is in room number 140. We'll post this on the bulletin board. Visiting hours are 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. weekdays and 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on the weekends. He will have therapy morning and afternoons. So I would encourage you to continue to pray for Burdett as he recovers from the accident that he encountered with a bull and uh, trust the Lord for bringing his healing. Sharon Burkheiser. Keith writes, Sharon's next appointment with the surgeon is scheduled for June 3rd, at which time, if all goes well, they will begin the process of weight bearing at 25%. How they calculate that is unknown to us. And increasing by 25% each week, if all goes well. You heard, of course, what Mary Trees wrote, Philip shared with you continue in prayer for Mary as well. And then just these few announcements also. Next Sunday, June 2nd, Rich and Carolyn Searles will be with us. And Rick will be ministering both in the Sunday school hour and in the morning worship service. Then on Sunday, July 7th, mark your calendars, Daniel and Rachel and the children will be with us from Israel. They'll be ministering in the Sunday school and worship service, and they'll be here, I believe, for several months, if I heard correctly when we talked to uh, Daniel's mother. Uh, that evening, July 7th, we are also going to have uh, an evening service at 6 p.m. Joaquin and Paki Lopez from Spain will be here and they'll be ministering in that service in the evening hour. June 9, I know this is a lot to throw at you, but I hope you keep it in mind. June 9, uh, we will be uh, having lunch together and then hearing from uh, Dr. Whitcomb via video. And then at about 2.30, for those who would like to take a trip to the Sierra Nevadas with John and Jonathan, uh, we will be showing that video that Jonathan has put together and give you the opportunity to enjoy uh, that journey of backpacking without the dangers involved. So uh, you may still get a little giddy as you look at some of the things that they pass through, but I trust that uh, your hearts might be encouraged too in what the Lord allowed them to do. Carol Ann, how did your granddaughter do with her surgery? Thank you for asking. She's home from the hospital. Good. And she's doing well. She has recovery. She can't lift for several weeks. Sure. And she has a baby, so that's a problem. But 
Doing well. Thank okay. You. All right. Good. We were praying for her and glad to know that there's progress reported already in what the Lord is doing. At this point, I'm going to call on uh, Laura Weinbach to share with us in the Ministry of Music. first verses, but the last verse states, Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me, whom have I on earth beside thee, whom in heaven but thee? Hopefully that is true of each one of us, that we realize all we have, all we are, all we hope to be resides in him. Our song of the month, 345, A New Heart He Gave Me. Feel like we're still learning this one maybe we need to recycle it in and uh, have it in a future month here somewhere again so that we get it ingrained a little bit but uh, continue learning together 345 and if you're able I'll ask you to stretch your legs and stand with me as we sing before the message <laughs> Thank you. 
has been called the laws of heaven for life on earth that's a good title don't you think laws of heaven for life on earth someone else has said it is not just a book of literature to be analyzed but a blueprint for life to be dramatized in the area of daily living Another said, God's handbook on the art of living for young and old. Because that wide range of ages is covered in the book. I like this one. And from this one, I chose the title of our message today. Here is God's transistorized wisdom. Transistorized wisdom. Transistor, a small crystal device containing semiconductors such as germanium or silicon that controls the flow of electricity in computers, radios, television sets, and other electronic equipment. I can remember the first crystal radio that I built and enjoyed lying in bed at night and listening to, of all things, the Chicago Cubs games being broadcast from 700 miles away on AM radio. We've come a long way in the making of radios. Uh, this is one that now handles AM, FM, short wave, and I can enjoy different things from different places but I want you to pay particular attention to the thought of the size, a small crystal device. That's why I call attention to it in the title of the message, Transistorized Wisdom. Because the word transistorized means to equip or reduce in size with transistors. I want to apply that this morning to the Word of God and have us understand what is being said as we begin a study here in the book of Proverbs. Here is true wisdom. In Proverbs, you're looking at not just a search for truth, you're looking at the discovery of truth in this book that comes from the hand and pen of Solomon. Indeed, it's more than just 
the discovery of truth. It is true. It is exactly what God tells us, and therefore we must pay attention. It is truth grasped. It is truth proven in everyday life. It gives forth the spirit of a little girl of whom it was said that she prayed, Lord, make the bad people good and the good people nice. <laughs> we need to begin anew today to pursue this wisdom. And we need to prove its power afresh in our own daily life. So I want you to look again at Proverbs chapter 1. And if you will, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That word beginning, the word that is used means first in place, first in time, or order, or rank. The word knowledge is a word in the Hebrew that means to have the facts to be skilled in, to be acquainted with. It is what one knows. It is a range of information that comes into our lives. And this verse, Proverbs 1, 7, is the motto, if you will, of Proverbs. Now, a motto is a brief sentence that is adopted as a rule of conduct. So we use things like think before you speak, look before you leap, always be obedient, or always be prepared. So if the, if the whole book of Proverbs is God's transistorized wisdom, if it is God's wisdom brought down in a compact form so that we can comprehend what truth is and what it requires of us, then this verse, just a single verse, in the book of Proverbs is the nanotechnology of God's wisdom. Nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is the techniques, the machines, the tools, and processes needed to manipulate matter the size of atoms and molecules. We have that same thought repeated in a slightly different form in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Here the word beginning is used in the sense of an opening, a commencement, first, the first time, and it comes from a word meaning to begin as if by an opening wedge, driving its way in and bringing more behind it. Wisdom means to be wise, to be skillful. There are synonymous parallelisms that come to us in the book of Proverbs. It's the theme and it calls our attention to the things that God records in these two verses in particular, but it reminds us that this that God is calling us to, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is also the theme of the whole Bible. In Psalm 111, verse 10, the psalmist says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. God wants us to understand that it is only the man, the person who reverences the Lord, who has truly started on the road to wisdom. You want to understand and know, and you want to apply and be skillful in the use of the knowledge that God has given then the more we obey him, the more light he gives us so that we can walk in obedience as we ought to him. Obedience, it has been said, is the organ of spiritual knowledge. Obedience. It expresses forth 
in melodious terms, if you will, that we are being obedient to the God of glory. If you turn with me to the book of Job, I want you to get a glimpse of this God whom we know. The book of Job and verses 20 through 28. Whence then cometh wisdom? It's a searching question, isn't it? Whence then cometh wisdom? And where is the place of understanding? Where does it reside? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living, man considers himself to be so wise. But if he doesn't begin with the fear of the Lord, he is literally blind. It is hid from the eyes of all living, kept close from the fowls of the air. Even the sharpest eagle eye cannot determine where does wisdom come from? And where is the place of understanding? Destruction and death say, destruction is our enemy. It is the God of this age who is set against us. And death comes out of the obedience that so many give to him. We've heard the fame thereof with our ears. God understandeth the way thereof. You want to understand wisdom? You'd better begin with God. God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. For he looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth under the whole heaven. No matter where you turn, no matter what part of the universe you find yourself in, you can't escape the fact that God is the one who has, has the monopoly on all knowledge, all wisdom. He knows where it lies. Notice what he does to make the weight for the winds. Do you realize that without atmospheric pressure, none of us would be alive? There would be no plant life, no animal life, no human life, because our veins and arteries and capillaries would all collapse we would die instantly. But God has designed this world in such a way that he provides for us through atmospheric pressure that life stays in our bodies. He weigheth the waters by measure. God knows exactly how much water the aqueous portion of earth there ought to be. And he knows just how much the land mass, the terrene, ought to be in relation to that. Three quarters of the earth is covered with water. God has provided for us in a marvelous way. When he made, uh, he weigheth the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain, he's the one who set in motion what happens with condensation evaporation and the process of bringing together the raindrops that fall upon our land. He made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. I like that word, a way. A way for the lightning of the thunder because it's a word that describes something that is serrated you ever noticed when a lightning flash <laughs> zigzag as it makes its way into the atmosphere? God controls that, the lightning of the thunder. Then did he see it and declare it. He prepared it, yea, and searched it out. And unto man he said, behold the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. This is the acknowledging of a sovereign God. God is sovereign. What do we know about sovereignty? Well, it involves on our part, certainly obedience. In every area, 
Obedience is the first step to knowledge and successful living. Sovereignty, supreme power, supreme authority, supremacy, freedom from outside control. That's our God. And he is the one who, by his servant Solomon, brings to us these sayings in the book of Proverbs that are what we need to live life obediently before him in this world. The most intelligent thing that you can do is to fear God. Fear him. Fear. Fear. That suggests something negative, doesn't it? I'll tell you, when I watch the video that Jonathan has prepared and that you will have the opportunity to see, and I saw some of the places he and John went in the night, in the dark, with headlamps, uh, it sent uh, fear through me in thinking of being there and engaging in that myself. Fear. We think of the negative connotations and many people have left behind any involvement with a God because they have misunderstood what the Bible means by this fear. The difficulty of many professing Christians is that they've never experienced salvation and they make an effort to serve God that is based on fear and not love. This fear, this fear, the fear of the Lord, is always positive. We all do things that displease God. There's no doubt about that. And fear is the proper attitude then, but it's not a craven fear. It's not a cowardly fear. It's not put myself in the corner and tremble in great fear because of God. As you were growing up, I would dare say you feared your parents. Not a fear that they would kill you or cripple you, but a fear as a child that uh, had done wrong and wanted to be on good terms with mom and dad. That's what we have here always seeking to be on good terms with God so that your heavenly father is not disappointed and it turns fear into reverence, a reverential awe in the God of heaven. It's not a slavish dread. It's, it's not what the pagans have as they go before their gods and seek to appease them and what is present in so much of today's religionism psalm 34 9 says oh fear the lord ye his saints for there is no want to them that fear him god is good and he meets the needs of the human heart and he has made it so very plain in fact, it's not the fear of God that brings a snare. It's the fear of man. That's what Solomon said in Proverbs 29 and verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. In contrast to that, Solomon says in chapter 14, verse 26, that the fear of the Lord is strong confidence in the fear of the Lord. Strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. That's not a God in whose presence you need to cower, thinking that uh, he is going to somehow destroy you. That's a God in whom you can have great confidence. God will do me good. That's his purpose for me. William Arnott said, the knowledge of God is the root of all knowledge. You truly want to be a knowledgeable person? 
you really want to understand the things of life that have true meaning, then it begins with the fear of the Lord. We need to understand this fear of the Lord 